Good evening and welcome to Allied Physicians Group 2023 Continuing Medica Medical Education Program. This evening we'll be covering autoimmune and autoinflammatory disorders. We'd like to introduce Dr. Fatima May, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Fatima? Okay, well, thank you so much. It's absolutely my pleasure to introduce Dr. Suhas Ganguly. He is a pediatric rheumatologist currently at K. Hovnanian Children's Hospital, which is part of Hackensack Meridian Children's Health at Jersey Shore University Medical Center. He is an assistant professor of pediatrics there, and his interests are patient reported outcomes in childhood onset lupus, improving patient safety, quality, and patient access in pediatric rheumatology. And on a personal note, I've known Sue Haas, uh, Dr. Ganguly, for very many years. He was an absolutely superb resident and chief resident when I um, was at Flushing Hospital. I had hoped that he would end up on the other side of the George Washington Bridge closer to us, but I'm glad that he's in the tri-state area. So it was my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ganguly. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mia, and thank you very much, Allied Pediatrics team, um, for the kind introduction, as well as for having me here. Um, without further ado, um, I will start the topic because there is a lot of materials to cover. So the topic today is titled Beyond Growing Pains, and we will be focusing on the early diagnosis and treatments of some of the common autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases that you will likely to see in your practice. I do not have a financial disclosure, but we shall be talking during the presentation about medications that are not FDA approved. The objectives are threefold. And number one, um, that's the primary goal, is to distinguish between the inflammatory and non-inflammatory musculoskeletal pain at the presentation. Um, Second is to recognize the early features and treatment opportunities for juvenile arthritis, systemic juvenile arthritis, and juvenile dermatomyositis. And lastly, we shall be talking about uh, diagnoses and comprehensive management of amplified musculoskeletal pain syndrome. Uh, joint pain is the most common reason for a referral to a pediatric rheumatologist. Um, there are three broad diagnostic categories. Um, either it's an inflammatory joint pain, which you will see in arthritis, uh, myositis. Sometimes there are non-inflammatory joint pains, uh, such as amplified pain or complex regional pain syndrome. And sometimes that's mechanical, um, injury-related or even overuse syndrome. So classification into the correct category expedites uh, diagnosis and treatment. Um, so the reason why uh, I picked this topic is uh, because of this. And just before we started the presentation today, um, Dr. Caraval and Dr. Mia, uh, Margaret and I, we were chatting about um, the pediatric rheumatology workforce. So as of now, there are 427 board certified pediatric rheumatologists in the entire United States. There are four states uh, with no pediatric rheumatologists, and there are 18 states um, with three or less pediatric rheumatologists. Uh, for example, where I was before joining Hackensack, I was the only pediatric rheumatologist in a 200-mile practice radius. So that does lead to a lot of wait time and a diagnostic delay. So uh, this, is a, this is a slide uh, based off the data from CARO Registry, which is the largest North American registry for children with rheumatic diseases. Uh, in juvenile arthritis patients, 31% um, were diagnosed more than six months after their symptom onset, and 16% were diagnosed more than one year after onset. For dermatomyositis, these numbers are 37% and 14% respectively. For lupus patients, um, 23% had moderate diagnostic delay and 9% had severe diagnostic delay, which is more than one year since symptom onset. Um, so a, a diagnostic delay in pediatric rheumatology is so critical that wait times for patients to see um, a, a rheumatologist is a nationally endorsed quality measure in, the, uh, in Canada which is where the primary care offices come in and um, they do play a very, very critical role. Uh, number one is to have a correct referral algorithm. So, um, you know, if, if the patient is referred to the um, inappropriate specialist, for example, orthopedician, 
for something that's inflammatory, that contributes to diagnostic delay. Also, it does contribute to some unnecessary procedures. For example, I've had patients who have had synovectomies, synovial biopsies for what could be a diagnosis of straightforward GIA. Um, also, even though we have a lot of excellent medications now, which you'll learn about in the next few slides, uh, the, you know, the key is to start treating early and aggressively. And longer the disease continues, there is increased disease activity, increased disability, both uh, from musculoskeletal standpoint as well as ophthalmologic standpoint. And lastly, uh, what we have learned during the COVID pandemic that health insurance, health maintenance, identification for you know infectious illnesses in these patients, as well as their immunization, um, is actually more significant than we previously thought. So that's where uh, primary care offices come in as well. Um, the challenging part of uh, diagnosing rheumatic diseases in children is that some of the vocab uh, vocabularies for um, rheumatic diseases in older adults or even young adults does not apply so much in children. For example, you know, a child never comes to your office and says that you know, they're um, stiff in the morning. So morning stiffness can be manifested as um, for example, limping early in the morning, early morning bedwetting in a child that's otherwise toilet trained because she or he is not able to um, get to the bathroom. Uh, difficulty holding a spoon at breakfast, but not so much in dinner or lunch because you know uh, joints are more painful in the morning. Also limp that worsens after a long car ride or after uh, taking a nap. Proximal muscle weakness, which is a feature of inflammatory myopathies, uh, can be manifested as uh, difficulty in getting off the floor, having trouble um, you know, stepping on the first step of the school bus, or sometimes kids are labeled lazy in the gym classes um, you know, uh, by their peers. Um, arthritis and hips and knees, uh, because um, sometimes in very young children who cannot point towards their site of discomfort, um, can be manifested as crying during diaper changes, uh, they wouldn't sit, crisscross applesauce, and won't kneel. A child who was sitting very comfortably in a sofa, bending their knees, will stop doing so because children are really, really uh, res um, resilient. And the first response to pain is to avoid the activity that causes the pain rather than reporting the pain. Um, same things with upper extremity arthritis. So we'll get to our first case. So our first patient is a three-year-old Caucasian girl who had a persistently swollen knee after falling on the playground that happened three months ago. Now, parents have noticed this limp that's typically getting worse in the morning or after a nap, but the child does not seem to be in pain. And you can see uh, this is not an actual picture of this child because you know, I don't have the permission to share the face, but this is an inventory picture and this is what she kind of looked like. So you do see that the left lower extremity um, you know, in this case, it's left, um, is a little longer than the right lower extremity. And on exam, you see the left knee swelling and a leg length discrepancy. The child has been seen by an orthopedic surgeon and an x-ray was, you know, um, done to rule out fracture. Uh, what you see is not a fracture, but you see a lengthening of the left lower extremity of the left knee joint. And this can be further confirmed by bending the child's knee just like this. So the patient was started on naproxen. She was sent to physical therapy and um, there was a positive ANA. So this basically brings us to a diagnosis of juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which is defined as objective signs of arthritis in one or more joints for at least six weeks or longer in a child that's younger than 16 years. Uh, that being said, all other causes of arthritis, including infectious illnesses, neoplasms, uh, and secondary autoimmune diseases, must be excluded before making the diagnosis of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So the classification of JIA has changed over time, but this is the most exciting time for the classification of JIA because it's now the change that's going to happen, and we're going to talk about that in the next uh, couple slides, will be based on a unifying um, of, of, of a unifying categories between children and adults. So on your rightmost side, the ILR classification is what is established now and it's being used now. So 
the classification is based on the number of joints joints involved. So if you have four or less joints involved within the first six months of disease, um, it's called oligoarticular ju juvenile arthritis. Now, if it stays like that beyond the first six months, then it's persistent oligoarticular. But if the child adds on more joints and becomes more than four beyond the first six months, then it's oligoextended. Polyarticular disease is when there is five or more joints involved within the first six months of disease. Polyarticular RF positive disease, where they have um, rheumatoid factor positive on two occasions, and usually uh, signifies very aggressive disease, very similar to adult RA. Systemic onset juvenile arthritis is usually arthritis with fever, rash, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, and uh, serositis. Um, a psoriatic arthritis is associated with either a psoriasis or a psoriasis within the first uh, degree family member. Enthesitis related arthritis is a representative of the spondyloarthropathies in children less than 16. Undifferentiated is when the arthritis does not meet one category or fulfills the diagnostic classification for more than one category. Now in this classification, so there are some points to consider. So uh, historically, all these three classifications of juvenile arthritis were a classification of convenience um, because the, the age 16 was uh, picked arbitrarily to, uh, because it was basically convenient to collate the data of children less than 16 years of age and not based on a biologic uh, reason. Now, our, I said our positive polyarthritis is same as children um, and in adults, it's fairly similar to adult RA. Systemic onset juvenile arthritis is same as adult onset stills disease. Uh, the number of inflamed joints based on which the classification, uh, I mean, uh, the classification is based on number of inflamed joints. Now this number of inflamed joints can change based on how you're looking at it. Uh, that is by clinical observation versus imaging studies. Also, there are uh, no contribution of genetics or the biomarkers, which are uh, you know, key points for treatment now. Uh, in this classification, which is why this classification is basically evolving. Um, in 2018, when I was a third year fellow, uh, this very provocative paper, uh, it was actually a review paper that came out of Boston Children's where um, they asked this question, why should we be calling this a juvenile arthritis? Is there a juvenile pneumonia or juvenile UTI? So the writing group for this paper, they proposed that this should be the, or somewhere similar to this, would be the accurate classification for juvenile arthritis. So one would be seropositive, where all children as well as adults would be included if they tested positive for rheumatoid factor. Seronegative would be um, poly polyarticular disease, but RF negative and all oligoarticular disease. And the ANA positive group would be included here in a separate category where you see this um, dark blue or purple um, halo. It's early onset arthritis. Spondylar arthritis would include psoriatic arthritis and ERA and a systemic juvenile arthritis would include both SGIA as well as adult onset stills disease. But this was a proposed classification. Um, PRINTO, which is the trial organization for uh, rheumatic diseases in children in Europe, um, which is basically a counterpart of uh, the North American CARA, uh, they propose these categories. So it would be systemic juvenile arthritis, enthesitis and spondylitis, then RF positive GIA, early onset ANA positive, other GIA where GIA does not fit any category, unclassifiable GIA where GIA fits more than one category. Um, this year, uh, uh, you know, uh, last year, basically earlier in August 2022, uh, the reach out cohort, uh, which is one of the largest cohort of juvenile arthritis patients in Canada, uh, worldwide actually, they had 1,200 patients. These patients were reclassified using the two uh, JIA classification system, which is the current ILR category, and the other system was a printo category, the one we just described. And they found this circus chart. So on the, the categories on your left are the ILR categories, which is what you know, and uh, you know all of us know as the different classes of juvenile arthritis. And on your right are the newly proposed printo categories. So if you see here, 
Um, oligoarticular arthritis, which is the most common type of juvenile arthritis in North America, as well as Europe, um, and also our first case, that category actually goes into either an early onset in a positive DIA or other. So, and same thing happens with the RF negative polyarthritis that the, all of it becomes through the other. So, um, as you can see, the vast majority of patients of that reach out cohort becomes either other or unclassifiable. So this is one of the struggles of the new classification, but I wanted to put this up here so that you know that in the years to come, the classification of JIA is actually moving towards a more unifying classification involving both ad adults and children. Juvenile arthritis or juvenile JIA is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, so I stands for idiopathic, which means that all the causes of possible secondary arthritis needs to be excluded. Uh, when you see a patient with joint pain, I think the most critical things uh, to, to exclude would be an infection, acute rheumatic fever, and neoplasm, and an underlying systemic disease, which could be a gastrointestinal illness like inflammatory bowel disease, which um, presents in children with arthritis sometimes, and systemic inflammatory diseases like um, lupus, sarcoid, or mixed connective tissue disease. So back to our first case again. So um, four or fewer joints in the first six months, onset between one to five years of age. If you have a child that's above nine years of age or having small joints at the beginning of an oligoarticular disease, please, please think of psoriatic arthritis because psoriatic arthritis, you will see later that arthritis can predate psoriatic rash by many, many months, sometimes years. So these are the early, um, early indicators that an arthritis will evolve into psoriatic arthritis. Um, our patient also had a positive ANA, which is actually not of diagnostic significance in patients with or children with arthritis, but it does, um, um, does signify a high risk factor for uveitis. And this uveitis is typically chronic and asymptomatic at the beginning. So regular screening by ophthalmologists are very, very important. One of the things that I really want to uh, mention here, and it kind of debunks a myth because um, the conventional uh, knowledge is that you expect a very high SED rate with an inflamed joint in chronic arthritis, but not so much in oligoarticular juvenile arthritis. In fact, the vast majority of patients will have a normal set or only a mild elevation. So if you have somebody with only one knee inflamed, like our patient, and if they had a set rate of 80 or 90, then please consider an underlying systemic disease, such as inflammatory bowel disease. Or if the child does not have IBD, there must be some uveitis going on there because one or two inflamed joints cannot account for a set rate of 80 or 90. So these are the risk factors for developing uveitis in juvenile arthritis. If the child is younger than seven, a positive ANA, oligoarticular category, and the risk is highest within the first four years of disease onset. Uh, as I said before, this is typically asymptomatic. So in other words, the children or the parents will not see a red eye or a painful eye or watering. Over time, if it's not detected and not treated, the patient will lose uh, you know, their vision substantially. Um, some of the complications can include corneal clouding, cataracts, glaucoma, and blindness. So all the patients with the respective of their GIA categories must be screened with a slit lamp periodically. So these are some of the photos with patients with uveitis and their complication. I want you guys to uh, focus especially on the picture on your left. Um, you see how the pupillary margin is irregular and this is because of chronic uveitis causing synechia. So what I tell parents, and this is quite useful because I've had patients whose parents were educated to look for this in their children and they actually picked up uveitis before the child had symptoms. So when we, uh, you, you know, when we see somebody with the first diagnosis of juvenile arthritis, this is the education that we give to the parents. So that look for irregular pupils periodically in your child. If you see that, then that's kind of alarming because what happens is because of the inflammation, the iris gets stuck to the, stuck to the lens and synechia forms. If there is synechia formation, that can lead to, uh, you know, uh, cataract formation as well as impaired drainage of the equus and can cause glaucoma. So here you see a dense cataract 
beneath the synechia. And this is band keratopathy, which is a late complication for um, GI-related uveitis. Um, this is uh, a summary of the screening protocol uh, from the latest guideline of the American College of Rheumatology and Arthritis Foundation. So this, um, th there used to be a guideline in 1993 published by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which was quite complicated. Now it's really simplified. So we have to see first the category of juvenile arthritis. So one group would be oligoarticular disease, polyarticular disease, and psoriatic and undifferentiated. The other group, which has very low risk of uveitis, would be systemic juvenile arthritis, polyarthritis, which is RF positive, and ERA. So these will, patients will need slip lamp exam only once in six to 12 months. But the rather higher risk categories would be subdivided based on the risk factors we discussed in the previous slide. So if they have these risk factors, they will need as frequently as three months, because this is something that we have to convince our ophthalmology colleagues that these patients, even though they're not symptomatic, they do need to be seen um, very frequently. So we will move on to the second patient. The second patient is a 15-year-old South Asian girl with painful joints to fingers of both hands over the last two months, causing difficulty in gripping, writing, and there is considerable gelling in the morning. Um, on exam, there is arthritis of multiple bilateral PIPs, MCPs, um, as well as left wrist and both knees. So in other words, mostly symmetric polyarticular disease. Uh, their pediatrician immediately started her on naproxen after these findings. Um, in the blood work, you see a mildly elevated platelets, a slightly low hemoglobin, and a very strongly positive rheumatoid factor and a CCP. These are the x-rays. Um, so the x-ray shows basically a loss of joint spaces. There is significant amount of fusion and you see periarticular osteopenia. This is uh, typical uh, of um, a very aggressive or positive polyarthritis. And this disease, this category of disease mimics adult rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's five or more joints within the first six months of disease. This is more common in girls. Uh, this, they do have a, you know, about 40 to 50% have positive ANA, but this category does have a very low risk of uveitis. So um, a positive, when we say positive rheumatoid factor, it means that it's rheumatoid factor positive on two occasions, at least 12 weeks apart. Same goes for the anti-CCP antibody. Uh, which is also a harbinger of poor prognosis. So this is also where, as I said, you know, this mimics with uh, mimics adult rheumatoid arthritis. You will see all the deformities um, in these children that we read about in medical school: uh, the boutonniere deformity, the swan neck deformity, for example. This one is a swan neck deformity where you see a flexion deformity of the uh, DIPs and the hyperextension deformity of the um, PIPs. Um, we do not see so much of this um, muscular atrophy and ulnar drift because by the time the patients develop this, fortunately, they're out of our practice and they follow with the adult rheumatologist. And this deformity, which is flexion deformity of the PIP and hyperextension of the DIP, is, seen, uh, is known as the boutonniere deformity. Um, further along in this patient, the symptoms obviously keep worsening despite naproxen for six weeks. I get this phone call from their wonderful pediatrician um, giving me a heads up that this patient is coming. We plan to discuss methotrexate with the family. Um, and the pediatrician, she recommends the, to the family a chest x-ray prior to the appointment. And this is what we saw in the chest x-ray. So do you see these uh, white patches uh, on, the, on the chest, basically? So uh, these are rheumatoid nodules uh, in the lungs, uh, which is very rare. But rheumatoid nodules are typically seen over the bony prominences and pressure points, like distal to the ulcer, on the flexor tendon sheets, sometimes aculus tendon soles of the feet, but very, very rarely they can be seen in lungs. Now, the chest, chest x-ray was ordered to clear the patient from methotrexate. In the adult world, methotrexate uh, used to be associated with lung fibrosis, so it's a practice to do a chest x-ray, but in this case, the chest x-ray picked up these rheumatoid nodules. 
which histologically are, um, you know, fibrinoid necrosis surrounded by parasitic macrophages or lymphocytes. Um, they do indicate a poorer prognosis. The reason why um, we got talking is that methotrexate, even though this is a very good medication for uh, treating polyarticular juvenile arthritis, can lead to accelerated nodulosis. So for this patient who was started eventually on methotrexate, we needed to keep a very a close eye on whether these rheumatoid nodules in our lungs were getting worse or not, because they can cause a respiratory difficulty if they, you know, if they increase. So these are some more photos of rheumatoid nodules on the olecranon on, on the knuckles. So the patient continues to be on methotrexate, um, comes back, sees some, uh, you know, we do find some residual arthritis in the left knee and both ankles. There is neck pain, limited extension. The family asks if they can start physical therapy. Now, one of the complications for polyarticular or positive rheumatoid arthritis is atlantoaxial subluxation, cervical spine arthritis. So when we ordered the x-ray of this patient, there was a, actually an atlantoaxial subluxation and joint ankylosis, which you don't see nowadays a lot uh, because, because of the medications that we have. But this is where you see uh, complete loss of cervical lordosis and the vertebral bodies are fused. So this patient was sent to spine surgery and we had to add a TNF inhibitor, which you will learn that it's actually a standard of care now to begin uh, from the get-go. So before we uh, talk about treatment, I'd like to say a few things about when to get imaging in arthritis. The diagnosis of arthritis is clinical. Um, so use of radiographs or conventional x-rays to look for you know, joint effusion or inflammation is going to be futile and it's really discouraged. Um, it can be useful in assessing deformities. If you have had a patient who has not been getting treatment for a long time, then it can be useful in, um, you know, assessing deformities, but not very sensitive in terms of picking up synovitis, effusion, or erosions. Um, use of imaging is conditionally recommended by the ACR for intraarticular joint injections. In my practice, um, the large joints, the knees, the ankles, wrists, elbows, I do mostly without guidance in older children in the office. We do use guidance for SI joints from TMJ injections and sometimes for hips and shoulders, although shoulder arthritis is very, very rare in, uh, in the age group that we see. Um, the value of MRI is actually in diagnosing um, sacroiliitis, TMJ arthritis, and we're going to talk about why TMJ is a little different from all other joints. So before we had ultrasound and MRI, um, many children as well as adults would go on to develop temporomandibular joint arthritis to an extent that they would have jaw deformity and facial deformities. Um, and that would happen really under the nose of the rheumatologist because um, as opposed to other joints in the body, anatomically, the uh, joint cavity or the synovial space in the temporomandibular joint is really large compared to the, um, the head of the condyle. So it takes a lot of arthritis and joint destruction and, you know, um, uh, effusion for somebody to have jaw pain from TMJ arthritis. So the way we diagnose a TMJ arthritis nowadays is by doing a TMJ challenge. So it's basically known as three finger test when we ask the patients to place their own three fingers between their two incisors without touching the incisors. If the patient experiences pain in their jaw, I mean, you, you guys can try it yourself. You should not be experiencing pain while trying this or by doing side to side motion. If that happens, that's an indication for MRI, you know, ordering an MRI of the TMJ because it's one of the most frequently used synovial joints in the body. The third patient is, um, it's, I think it's very obvious to you. Uh, so what you see on your right is nail changes with psoriasis. So these are the nail pits. There is some onycholysis. Also, these are the classic psoriatic plaques on the extensor surfaces. So psoriatic arthritis is either presence of arthritis with one of these rashes that you saw just now, or 
um, not necessarily the rash, but arthritis with either a family history of psoriasis in a first degree relative, dactylitis, which is soft tissue swelling of fingers or toes um, traversing the joint line. So in other words, the tissue swelling is outside the joint uh, and it involves the entire digit and nail pitting what you saw basically. If somebody has an HLB27 positivity or if there's a family history of HLB27 disease, or if there's arth positive um, arthritis in, you know, on two occasions, so then, then they're excluded from this classification. Um, oligoarticular disease above nine years of age, small joint involvement in oligoarticular disease. Uh, these are the uh, you know, early indicators that an arthritis may evolve into psoriasis. They're frequently ANA positive. They do have increased risk of hydrocyclitis. This is a category that can get acute iritis as well as chronic uveitis. Arthritis can predate psoriasis by many, many months, sometimes even years. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting facts um, that about psoriatic arthritis is even though uh, you know, um, psoriatic arthritis has its own criteria, own clinical features, it can be initially very difficult to uh, distinguish from atopic dermatitis. Not only psoriatic plaques can look like eczema, but atopic dermatitis patients can also have nail pits. So, you know, sometimes we have to have a dermatologist get involved with these patients. So these are some of the um, patients with psoriatic arthritis. Here you see there is a soft tissue swelling that involves the entire digit traversing the joint line. So dactylitis could be either a spindle shaped deformity um, around a joint um, traversing the joint line or the entire digit can be swollen, um, which is known as, um, you know, sausage digit. Um, you guys may have heard of um, arthritis mutilants in a very aggressive type of arthritis seen in psoriatic arthritis in adults. That's fortunately not seen in children. Here you see, as opposed to the, this is a dactylitis of the toe, where the entire toe is basically symmetrically inflamed. The next category is antheses related arthritis. So the first question is, what are the antheses? So the antheses are the sites of attachments of the muscles, ligaments, and tendons with the bones. So they're not the ligaments themselves or the tendons themselves, because in that case, they would be tendonitis and not antheses. So usually it's the site of attachment. They're typically asymmetrical arthritis. They also have um, coexistent sacroiliac joint inflammation. This is the only type of juvenile arthritis which is more common in males. Um, it's also very strongly associated with HLA-B27. The uveitis risk here is low, but typically the uveitis is acute anterior uveitis. In other words, the patients will get symptoms as soon as there is uveitis. Also, the uveitis here is less likely than the other types of JIA to lead to chronic visual trouble. Uh, this is also a category that uh, the prevalence is high in South Asians. So this is a, this is a picture from Wikimedia Commons, basically. Um, these are the sites of attachments. This is where the, uh, the inflammation occurs in antecitis. So these are some of the common anthesial spots. Um, one of the uh, one of the differentials for enthesitis, which is more common in your practice than this, certainly is overuse syndrome, such as osgood slatter or Severs disease. The key differentiation between enthesitis and overuse syndromes is in overuse syndrome, it's typically limited to one site, but in enthesitis related arthritis, it is usually more than one. And also if the patient has a positive HLB27, that helps between distinction. But I have seen in my, in my practice, the patient who was diagnosed initially with severe disease or osgood slatter disease evolve into emphasitis related arthritis. So this is the classification criteria, either arthritis and emphasitis or arthritis and emphasitis with two of the followings. Of these, one, there's one point I would like to elaborate on, which is inflammatory lumbosacral pain or inflammatory back pain. So the inflammatory back pain is a back pain that typically gets worse in the morning, gets worse with prolonged rest and or inactivity and improves with activity, alternate buttock pain, and, um, you know, typically worse in the morning. So these are the features of inflammatory back pain. 
Now, the, before we go on to the next section, um, here we'll, I'd like to make a case for early treatment of juvenile arthritis. Now, this is a, this is a very iconic image of a 14-year-old girl who uh, was diagnosed as such with multiple arthritis and uh, multiple arthritis-related de skeletal deformities. As you can see, at 14, she was three feet nine inches. And this was, the, this was before 2000, when the first biologics came in the United States. And when she reached her full height at the age of 18, she only attained a full height of four feet from three feet, nine inches to four feet. And that was her final height. So early treatment uh, leads to improved functional outcome, improved quality of life. Erosions are less likely. Um, also, we are, uh, you know, we are, our population is growing population, so we have to prevent growth disturbances. Um, one of the big sources of disability in juvenile arthritis patients is chronic eye disease. So that can also be prevented by early aggressive treatment. Uh, for very young kids, uh, there could be motor delays uh, if there is delay in diagnosis and treatment. And overall psychosocial outcome is also improved with early treatment. Um, for treating juvenile arthritis in most centers, including ours, this is the algorithm that we follow. Um, we have borrowed this from adult rheumatology. When there is a diagnosis of active rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile arthritis, uh, the physician and the family, we sit down and we discuss the treatment goal or the, go you know, the, the outcome, because uh, the treatment often involves immune suppression, so which has its own risk. So typically for adults, it's a choice between low disease activity versus no disease activity. But in children, it's almost always the target is remission. So according to the American College of Rheumatology, uh, no treatment should continue for longer than three months if there is no effect. So we, when we start a treatment, we do expect to move closer to remission or mo move closer to our treatment target within the first three months of that treatment. If that does not happen, we sit down again and adjust medication. So th this is basically uh, the model for treat to target. The main treatment modalities are NSAIDs um, in the beginning. But as of now, from according to the 2022 uh, guidelines, NSAIDs and intraarticular steroids for oligoarticular disease, they occupy the same space. In my practice, if I see a patient with oligoarticular disease or you know one knee, one ankle, um, I do uh, I do go in and uh, perform that joint injection before uh, putting the patient on NSAIDs because of how safe it is and how quick it is. Um, Non-biologic DMARDs, of, of which the most common is methotrexate, which we have been using for now 40, 50 years in children and over eight decades in adults with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, for biologics, these are some of the common biologic agents. Um, as of now, the biologic agents that are used for juvenile arthritis are mostly subcutaneous and um, mostly, you know, um, injectable, basically. Um, there is a synthetic small molecule that's the Janus kinase inhibitor, which is um, tofacitinib. And this is approved for at least two indications, two types of juvenile arthritis. And currently, um, there, there is trial going on for systemic onset juvenile arthritis. So, so that, that helps a little bit uh, for children and parents who are apprehensive about injections. Uh, physical and occupational therapy are cornerstones as well. Um, treatment of oligo and polyarticular juvenile arthritis. Um, as I said, intraarticular steroid injection is the first line treatment for oligo juvenile arthritis. Methotrexate is recommended over the other synthetic non-biologic DMARDs, polyarticular disease. Um, for example, in the patient, um, the, the patient that we saw in our second patient, uh, ideally they should start biologic and DMARD at the same time. Anthocytes related arthritis, the policy is to start them on NSAIDs while we wait for the uh, biologics to get approved by the insurance and TNF inhibitors are the treatment of choice. Um, in, we have really moved away from systemic steroids. If we really have to use it, we use it for the shortest possible time and the lowest possible dose. Now, moving on to the fourth patient. It's a 12-year-old girl with daily fevers for three weeks. There is a generalized rash and left ankle pain for the last two months. Um, physical exam shows cervical lymph nodes. 
there is diminished breath sounds on the right side, bilateral ankle and wrist diffusion. And uh, the fever somewhat looks like this. So if you see um, every day, there are usually two spikes of fever. Um, this is the classic double cotidian fever, and this is the rash. So the rash is salmon pink macules on the arms, forearms, and mostly trunk. That's uh, getting more prominent with the fever spikes. Um, she does have an anemia, elevated platelet count, elevated WBC count, and a very high sed rate. She also has a high ferritin, and her liver enzymes are elevated. Her infectious workup is negative. And when we do a chest X-ray, there is a right-sided opacity. Um, so this brings us to the um, entity of systemic onset juvenile arthritis, which is presence of arthritis associated with or preceded by a daily fever for at least two weeks, plus at least one or more of these uh, features. Now, this, class, this definition is for classification purposes and not for diagnostic purposes. You can have a systemic juvenile arthritis or systemic GIA without the A for months. So systemic features can um, you know, precede arthritis by months. And I have had patients who never had arthritis and had a diagnosis of systemic GIA all along. Now, this patient turned out to have interstitial lung disease, which is an entity um, is being recognized in the last couple of years in the context of systemic juvenile arthritis. Um, this is uh, associated with a very high mortality. Initially, when this was, um, this was uh, found, um, a lot of rheumatologists, um, particularly North America, blamed the biologics. But later on, um, a, a, you know, multiple cohorts with large number of patients emerged from India, from Asia Pacific, where biologics are not as prevalent. And it turned out that biologics were probably not related to um, you know, interstitial lung disease and systemic JIA. Um, so we do, did continue biologics in this patient um, who was treated with anakinra. Um, three months later, um, she comes back again, this time with very high fever, shortness of breath, in shock, and in altered mental status. The white blood cell count, which was 26,000, a diagnosis, now it's 1,100. Uh, the hemoglobin dropped a little bit, and she had a high platelet count, now it's 23,000. The sed rate, which was 77, now it's only four. The ferritin went up to 19,000. And there is a drop in fibrinogen and the AST and ALT, which were high, you know, moderately elevated, now they're really, really elevated. So... This is consistent with this very complication of macrophage activation syndrome, which is a type of cytokine storm. Um, some of us have been familiar with this since uh, COVID. Uh, so this is a form of secondary HLH, uh, where you would see fever, um, encephalopathy, DIC-like picture, pancytopenia, elevated ferritin, elevated triglyceride, Particularly in the context of children who has been have been exposed to COVID, the hypofibrinogenemia can be really helpful because it helps us distinguish MAS from uh, MESI uh, related to COVID because in MESI, the fibrinogen is typically high and in HLH or MAS, it's typically low. So things to watch out for is a dropping sed rate or very high ferritin or increasing ferritin in a patient who already had high ferritin, which is a common feature in systemic JIA. Um, the HLH 2004 criteria does not apply in systemic onset juvenile arthritis because they have a baseline elevation of ferritin. So this is a classification criteria for macrophage activation in systemic juvenile arthritis. But as I said, Regardless of the criteria, it's important to follow the trend. So if you see a systemic GI patient having worse fevers, but their counts are dropping, their sed rate is dropping, their ferritin is going up, their AST, ALT are, are going up, regardless of whether they fulfill the criteria or not, we have to be really aggressive and you know, put the patient in ICU and start treating for macrophage activation. The key points for the most recent um, ACR guideline for systemic JIA treatment is um, if the patient does not have MAS at the time of diagnosis, it's safe to patient, uh, treat the patient with IL-1 inhibitors or IL-6 inhibitors without steroids. So this is a major change from the practice that was prevalent two, three, four years ago. 
that uh, typically systemic juvenile arthritis patients would be started on steroids while we wait for the anakinra to be approved by insurance. But right now, uh, we start anakinra right from the get-go. And in my practice, the patients do not get any steroids unless they have MAS. Of course, if they have MAS, they will need high-dose steroids. Um, this is one category of juvenile arthritis where I find um, kind of unsettling to wait on NSAIDs alone. Um, it, the ACR does allow um, you know, up to two weeks of, um, of NSAID treatment and up to two weeks of systemic steroid monotherapy in exceptional circumstances. For example, if you're not able to get anakinra for the patient. So the next patient is a six-year-old Caucasian girl um, she was diagnosed with celiac in June of 2020. The last two months, she's having trouble taking off the socks, um, difficulty climbing the steps of the school bus, and tires out very easily. And she was labeled as being lazy by her best friend in the gym class because she wouldn't throw a ball. Now, there was a significant drop in appetite. There were low-grade fevers and a two-pound weight loss. When she came to our clinic, um, this is the type of rash that she had on her elbows and knees. Uh, so these were these were erythematous patches with ulcerations. Some of them were healed, some of them were partially healed. And typically this rash was uh, more prominent whenever she went out in the sun. Um, on her hand, she had only a faint erythema over the knuckles, but not much more. On the neuromuscular exam, she did have uh, weakness of the proximal muscles in the, you know, particularly the neck flexors and the extensors and the upper arms and especially the thighs. But there was no arthritis or enthesitis. This is not a picture of this girl. This is a, uh, this is typically a, you know, a model picture of a child exhibiting Gower sign, which this patient also had. So this brings us to the entity of juvenile dermatomyositis. Um, it is the most common inflammatory myositis of childhood, uh, regardless of demography. Um, it's characterized by inflammation of the striated muscles, skin, but it's really the inflammation of uh, what defines juvenile dermatomyositis is really inflammation of the small blood vessels um, around the small blood vessels. Calcinosis is usually the late feature we want to avoid. Um, now, juvenile dermatomyositis um, has a bimodal distribution, but the peak age of onset is around seven. And there is a second peak that's seen around 12 to 14. And this is also more common in girls than boys. Um, these are some of the typical rashes of juvenile dermatomyositis. The, the first one is the classic heliotrope rash where you see an erythematous violaceous patch around the eyelids. There could be some periorbital swelling associated with it. And um, the, 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 these are the erythema, erythematous patches or even Gortrans patches or Gortrans papules, which you can see on the knuckles as well as the extensive surfaces, such as your elbows and um, knees. Now, this is shawl sign, which we don't see so much in younger children. It's seen um, more commonly in older children, where it's also known as V sign, where you see a large erythema patch on the trunk as well as back, typically in the sun exposed areas, and they get worse. Um, these are gotrans, again, in various forms. And these are some um, calcinosis or calcification, which is usually the late feature of disease. Um, Gautron's papules are basically the hallmarks of um, juvenile dermatomyositis diagnosis. Uh, typically, it's seen on the dorsal surfaces over the MCP, PIP, and DIP joints. Um, I have not seen on the toes, but they can, you know, they can show up on the toes. Elbows, knees are fair game. One of the common differential diagnoses is psoriasis, particularly if a patient does not have muscle weakness. So. Um, there is a subset of dermatomyositis where you do not have so much of clinical muscle weakness, only the rash. <coughs> Sorry. And that's where, uh, you know, this confusion can come because um, those are known as hypomyopathic or amyopathic disease. Uh, Gautron's sign is where you do not have the papule. In other words, the rash is not raised, but only red skin or erythema, which is what we saw in our patient. And 
in adults, Gortron's papules have been described on the palmar surface sometimes, and these are called inverse Gortron's, and they're associated with interstitial lung disease. Um, back to our patient, our patient also had these lesions um, on their medial malleolus, so we were worried whether these were um, just skin atrophy, which is found in, you know, um, dermatomyositis, sometimes because of lipodystrophy or just because of um, skin atrophy versus whether these were calcifications. So we did end up getting biopsy uh, of these rashes. Unfortunately, there was no calcinosis. Calcinosis is found in approximately 40% of patients. Uh, mostly it's a late complication, but very, very rarely they, they can happen at the time of diagnosis. Um, the treatment is, uh, is not really very effective and treatment is quite challenging, including high dose of immune suppressions, steroids, immune globulins, uh, biologics such as uh, tocilizumab or abatacep, but the success is quite limited. And sometimes, especially if calcinosis occurs around the joints, we can talk more about it at the end, uh, they may require surgery. Um, one of the things that are very useful in diagnosing, uh, screening, and monitoring patients with dermatomyositis is nail fold capillaroscopy. So, so nail fold capillaroscopy is performed using either a magnifying glass or a gem cutter slide, which you can get off the Amazon. It's cost really $7, or you could just use the ophthalmoscope in the office. So what you expect to see is this. So and the, the picture on, on your top left is what how nail, nail full capillaries should be in a, in a patient without dermatomyositis or patient who has dermatomyositis but does not have advanced vasculopathy. And these are various stages of nail full capillary abnormalities, which could be looping, could be dropouts, and eventually, you know, um, complete, complete avascularity. So nail fold capillary changes indicate GI vasculopathy, indicates um, you know, the risk of GI bleeding, risk of ulceration, and also poor absorption. So our patient did have some nail fold capillary abnormalities, which is why, if you remember, the patient did have a poor appetite and two pound weight loss. So these are also patients where the initial treatment with even with the steroids should be IV rather than oral because they have a very unreliable oral absorption. The myositis, is even though this is a, this is predominantly a skin or muscle disease, but the mortality is really from the organ involvement, such as um, gastrointestinal system, respiratory system, where you see interstitial and restrictive lung disease, cardiovascular uh, disease, hypertension, which is a function of the disease, as well as steroid treatment, and there could be constitutional features. The the flower on the top right is the classic heliotrope. So heliotrope basically means the flower facing the sun. So the rash that you see in patients with dermatomyositis is named after this flower. Um, the differential diagnosis of dermatomyositis is far and wide really. Um, so I will not go into the details of it. Uh, um, the diagnostic confirmation is by um, getting the muscle enzymes, which should be elevated. 25% um, of patients have a positive ANA. <clears throat> Myositis-specific antibodies, which is usually a, a special test, indicates specific complications. And it's desirable that all patients have their myositis-specific antibodies done before beginning treatment. Uh, and, you know, um, almost always the patients will require a demonstration of myositis using an MRI. Um, the key to order the MRI is, well, I'll show you pictures that to order the T2 weighted fat suppressed images. And muscle biopsy shows perifascicular atrophy and necrosis. So these are some uh, pictures from patients with dermatomyositis on MRI. You see there is diffuse intramuscular edema and typically the pelvic girdle and the thighs, which are MRI. And it is also helpful uh, locating a site for the biopsy. So these are the stir images of the same patients where you see really extensive um, inflammation and edema of the pelvic muscles. Um, these are some of the myositis-specific um, antibodies. Uh, the, the, the limitation of these is by the time the initial uh, treatment started, the results are almost never available. Uh, but you know the, uh, we still we still get them to predict long-term uh, complications and. Uh, you know, deciding future treatment. 
Um, these are myositis associated antibodies, which are a little less specific, uh, but it's desirable that we get them. Our patient did have a positive MJ antibody, which is associated with poor prognosis and risk of GI bleeding. Fortunately, she did well so far. This is a classic um, dermatomyositis biopsy, which shows uh, you know, perifascicular distribution of the inflammatory cells. And also there is, you will see the regenerating and degenerating muscle fibers. I'll compare this with a normal muscle biopsy, which you will see what this normal mus muscle biopsy basically looks like. So coming back to our patient who also had a celiac disease and juvenile dermatomyositis, there is a high prevalence of DQA allele in both these diseases. It's unclear if this is related to the pathogenesis of these individual conditions, but there is at least one or two case reports in adult dermatomyositis patients where changing diet to a gluten-free diet um, alone actually led to remission, but that did not happen in our patient. Uh, these are some of the first-line treatment modalities. The dermatomyositis treatment is, the mainstay is steroids. So this is one rheumatic disease which with highest steroid burden. We do add steroid sparing agent right from the get-go, but still most of these patients ended up, <coughs> end up getting steroids for nearly a year. Um, so CARA does have a three pathways for treatment of dermatomyositis patients based on you know, their uh, disease severity. Our patient who did have, uh, at the time of diagnosis, she was unable to sit upright. She did not have, she was unable to hold her head. So we started her with pulse steroids and uh, methotrexate basically. Um, the prognosis for dermatomyositis, um, I go by a rule of 25 for uh, easy memory. So 25% patients will experience a monophasic course. That is, you discontinue medications within the first two years and the disease never comes back. 25% will have a polyphasic course with waxing and waning of disease and periodic return of active dermatomyositis. And the remaining half will have a chronic course. <coughs> so these are some of the poor prognosticators for the myositis. Um, now, our next case is a 16-year-old girl with a two months of joint pain. And the pain is in her arms, legs, bilateral, um, in, and it's basically worse at night. It's related to activity. And when we ask to score her pain, the pain she will say 12 out of 10. Although when you talk to her parents, she appears very comfortable on the exam table, but she cannot get out of the bed in the morning due to poor quality of sleep and therefore has missed 10 days of school in the last month. And this time she is in, in your office requesting a letter for home instruction. Um, there is some headache, there is abdominal pain, but there's no fever or there's no rash. Uh, the pain, uh, there is range of motion, uh, pain with range of motion of all joints. And there is some diffuse tenderness in the paraspinal muscle area, but there is really no effusion. There is no swelling. There is no limitation of motion. The labs are all normal, including inflammatory markers. So this brings us to the discussion of amplified musculoskeletal pain syndrome. So this is a picture that I basically um, show my patients with amps or amplified pain, that amplified pain is for practical purposes, an alteration of the brain and spinal cord pain thermostat. So pain is a defense mechanism of our body to protect us from injuries and other noxious um, you know, insults uh, to our body. But if the pain threshold is adjusted from, let's say 70 to 60 here, any activity that would give you a pain of 60 and 70, which was not felt as pain before and now is being felt as pain. So the natural response of the body to avoid that activity and the stimuli. So what happens with that, this, uh, this you know, after a period of inactivity, this um, 60 becomes 50. And then everything else about 50 starts hurting and she avoids those activities as well. So this is basically how pain amplifies. So the pain increases and the activity reduces. 
So this, this, this picture I found uh, really helpful in making patients understand the mechanism of amplified pain. Now, amplified pain can be of uh, various types, which is uh, number one is diffuse amplified pain. The other name is uh, fibromyalgia. There is intermittent amplified pain where the symptoms of um, severe pain in muscles and joints come back and go. And complex regional pain syndrome, which can involve any one part of the body, um, such as you know what's known as frozen shoulder in older adults, um, or it could be generalized. The treatment modalities for amplified pain um, is, so there are three things that have been found to be really helpful. Number one is physical therapy directed at increasing the uh, musculoskeletal conditioning, um, increasing passive range of motion. And the second thing is um, basically a pain psychologist. Very few practices, unfortunately, in the Northeast have a dedicated full-time pain psychologist for treating amplified pain. And the third thing is aerobic activities. So aerobic activities could be in the form of graded exercise programs, or um, what I tell, tell the patients is usually to pick the activity they used to like before. So this way it does not feel like a chore. So you know the, the adherence rate is higher. Um, uh, there is not a lot of, uh, lot of uh, support or evidence support um, evidence-based supporting the use of medications, for example, tricyclics or gabapentin in children. There was a Cochrane review performed specifically directed at uh, medications, and it did not really uh, find any evidence uh, supporting their use in children. Although for young adults, they're fair game. Um, if a child does have a non-restorative sleep, so having improving sleep hygiene, so uh, the common techniques would be uh, you know, having a fixed bedtime, avoiding uh, screen exposure, avoiding any workout basically within one hour of bedtime, avoiding daytime naps, avoiding caffeine. Um, so these things can help, but um, you know, unless they have a disruptive sleep pattern, um, you know, giving, um, giving sleep meds is not going to help really. Before we close, um, I want to talk a little bit about the health maintenance of these patients when they end up in your office. So uh, the most important thing is immunization. All inactivated vaccinations, including the COVID-19 flu, are um, recommended. Um, pneumococcal vaccine, the PPSV23, in select patients, patients who are on methotrexate or a biologic, patients who have a disease that leads to immune suppression, such as lupus or hypogam. And if and, and when it comes to live vaccines, um, the decision is very individualized. Until 2023, ACR used to contraindicate live vaccines, but um, does not do that anymore. Um, sun protection is critical, so go with the AP recommendation of sun protection, um, 30 or more. Um, fever and an immune suppressed patient. So the thing to remember is we tell the patients to call the pediatrician or call us if there's a fever. That being said, there are patients who are high-dose steroids, about 20 milligrams daily, or on a TNF inhibitor, which is adalimumab, infliximab, etc. They can have their febrile response knocked off because TNF is, um, you know, uh, one of the cytokines responsible for fever. So they should call us even if they're not having fevers and otherwise feeling unwell. Um, these are the uh, things that entities that require eye exams for juvenile arthritis patients, for uveitis, if somebody is on hydroxychloroquine once a year for retinal toxicity and long-term steroids for checking for cataract and glaucoma. Um, so these are some of the practical takeaways uh, from what we covered. Um, the classification of juvenile arthritis, as we know it, is going to change in the next one or two years. Um, because GIA is a very heterogeneous um, disease, different diseases put together in one box forcibly. Systemic juvenile arthritis is an autoinflammatory disease where other juvenile arthritis are autoimmune. The early signs of arthritis and myositis may be quite subtle in children. Uh, the uveitis risk is highest with positive ANA. If a child is less than seven within the first four years of disease onset, and they do need regular screening, even if they do not have symptoms. Um, the diagnosis of arthritis is clinical. I mean, uh, we can go on talking about ANA, but ANA in these group of patients only predicts uveitis risk, and rheumatoid factor predicts 
how aggressive the disease is going to be. They don't diagnose arthritis. Elevated sed rate um, or disproportionately elevated sed rate in a patient with oligo GIA please suspect systemic disease such as inflammatory bowel disease, sarcoid, or anything else. Um, AMPS um, requires a high index of suspicion. It's important to rule out inflammatory conditions before we make a diagnosis of AMPS. And, um, you know, as I said, um, in, for when some of these patients get fever, especially if they're on high dose steroids, or, or, you know, if they're on high dose steroids and TNF inhibitors, they may not get fever and they still can be very ill. So um, this is the close of the presentation. Thank you very much for your time. And, and these are some of the resources for our patients as well as uh, for ourselves as physicians. So, you know, these are very helpful um, sources for information. Thank you very much for your touch. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Ganguly. We do have a few questions in the chat. Sure. Um, let's see. The first one we have is we frequently see Raynon symptoms in patients. When do these symptoms merit a workup for autoimmune uh, rheumatic disease? Great. So I can see the questions in the chat. So uh, the most are, uh, you know, both are very important questions. So for Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, typically Raynaud's can be of two types, primary and secondary. Um, if they're associated with a positive ANA or other autoimmune antibodies, in other words, the, you know, the specific antibodies for lupus, if they have other symptoms like rashes, if they have um, joint pains, or if they have a family history of autoimmune disease, or if they have a nail fold capillary abnormalities, these patients are more likely to go on in the future to develop a systemic autoimmune disease or secondary autoimmune disease. So um, at the very least, for patients with Raynaud symptoms, I would recommend getting at least an ANA, uh, basic blood count, and a nail fold capillaroscopy if possible. Um, that's what we do for all our newly referred Raynaud's patients. So if any of these is abnormal, these are the patients that we follow periodically. Otherwise, we just let them go. <laughs> I can, um, does that answer the first question? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> sorry, uh, I'm to unmute. Oh, sorry, no worries. Um, so I do see the second question. The ANA testing is frequently used, but not very specific. What is the significant number? One in 160, one in 320, et cetera. Does that merit additional assessment? This is also a very good question. And I, and I wish I could somehow incorporate this in the talk, but I'll, I'll answer this now. So before 2017, um, a positive ANA was considered to be one in 160 or more. So when I trained in Flushing Hospital under Dr. Mia, uh, this is what we learned. Uh, what happened in 2017 is the American College of Rheumatology and ULAR, which is the European counterpart of ACR, they got together and started revising the lupus classification criteria. And as an entry criteria, they lowered the ANA eligibility to one in 80. So as of now, 1 in 80 is considered to be significant because you can have a 1 in 80 ANA and have, you know, lupus. Um, now, ANA, as you have rightly said, is a very nonspecific test. It can be positive in up to 30% of normal children um, due to a pre-existing infection, pre-existing uh, family history. Um, there was a study performed in the VA hospitals um, in the 1990s where they actually picked out, uh, uh, you know, U U U.S. Marines with established rheumatic disease, and they went back in the ser serum repository, and they did see the patients who did have a low titer positive ANA. Some of them were at a higher risk of developing um, rheumatic diseases in the future. So um, that answers the second part of the question that does that merit additional assessment? So if a patient does, does have an, you know, one in 80 or one in 160 ANA, then at least one time it's advisable to get the specific autoantibodies. And if the specific autoantibodies are positive, 
then those patients need to be watched uh, for future development of autoimmune diseases. Otherwise, no. So that's... Okay, so I have one question for you. Sure. And part of the reason I asked you to speak is, uh, as you know, I've asked you um, frequently over the last few years about increasing numbers of patients I'm seeing with either AMPS or uh, uh, complex regional pain syndrome. And um, I don't find that uh, we have adequate um, access to rheumatology that's actually assessing for this um, in a uh, patient-friendly way, maybe I will say. But right. what can I do as a general pediatrician to possibly screen for other things. I, I often shy away from ordering uh, inflammatory type markers because I don't often know what to do with them when I get them back. Uh, but what can I do as a general pediatrician when I have patients coming in with sort of the complaints that might go along with AMPS uh, to help decipher whether or not they need on, you know, ongoing treatment just with not just with, but with more complex care in terms of maybe referral to a center that may be better for AMPS or helping me differentiate what to do with them? No, that's that's really great question, Dr. Mia, because you know um, this is a problem prevalent everywhere um, because of mainly two reasons. Number one is most centers, even with pediatric rheumatology, do not have the full bandwidth to care for these patients. You know, as I said before, uh, the uh, multimodality of treatment. Yes, yeah. Sorry. Um, it, 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 it requires experienced physical therapists. It requires pain psychologists. So before, you know, the, the patients get referred to rheumatology, a lot of pediatricians would obtain inflammatory markers, would obtain ANA, but my suggestion would be that to at least get these patients a very good joint exam and have arthritis ruled out. After that, um, the patients, the pediatrician and the rheumatologist basically need to get together and um, educate the patient about the nature of the disease and the need for multimodality treatment. So in our center, we do work with dedicated physical therapists who are actually experienced in uh, treating AMPS. And also we do have access to the state of New Jersey um, to some pain psychologists or general psychologists experienced with treating AMPS. But, uh, you know, Dr. Mia, I, I'm really sorry. I wish there was a different answer mm -hmm. that I could give you. Um, no, I appreciate and, it. I, I've used your advice in the past and sent uh, at least one of my patients to children specialized in New Jersey right. and had some good result there. So I appreciate that. But um, it is something that I think we as general pediatricians probably see an awful lot, maybe often dismiss, but need to be able to recognize this uh, condition in, in our, in our, on our pediatrician, in our, pedi in our, um, our patients uh, better and be able to provide them with better care. So, uh, yes. Yeah. And one other thing I would want to add, and I think I've shared, I will share the PDF of the slides, um, particularly the one with the AMPS where it, we show the pain thermostat. One thing that the patient and the parent, they need to know that the symptoms are really real. So the symptoms are not made up. So there have been functional MRI studies where you can see fMRI activities in brain with the intermittent flare-up of AMPS symptoms. So AMPS is a real disease uh, resulting from recalibration of pain sensitization, primary and secondary. There are two types. We couldn't get into all of those, but these are very real disease with a very real symptom. So that um, I think, uh, in my experience, that helps a lot when we tell the patients that, because the, uh, if many of these families, they just want to be heard and listened to. Agree. Thank you so much for that. I see a hand raised. Um, um so I know there's, there's one in the Q and A, if that's what you're seeing. Oh, I see a hand raised by Dr. Mevs. Um, oh, yeah. And, and 
Yeah, I do see the question in Q&A also. I'm going to address that. Um, so yes, um, I do see, we do see patients with Ehlers-Danlos and other collagen vascular diseases who get misdiagnosed with AMPS. But on the other side, uh, you know, the musculoskeletal symptoms for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is mostly resulting from hypermobility and joint instability. Now, hypermobility um, and joint instability are also independent risk factors for developing AMPS. So uh, if you go back um, to the pain thermostat, if there is constant pain, it could be arthritic pain, it could be a more generalized pain like in hypermobility, which could trigger um, the, the resetting of the pain thermostat. So um, yes, I mean, we do see patients uh, with ehlers danlos who have been diagnosed with AMPS, but it's not always misdiagnosed. So patients with hypermobility, joint instability, ehlers danlos they can go on to develop AMPS. But, uh, you know, um, so if that answers the question, it's possible that they can get, develop AMPS on top of what they have. All right, thank you. And then Dr. Mem's question that we had additionally was, have you ever seen pulmonary capillaritis with any rheumatologist conditions? Yes, yes, that's a great question. And thanks for bringing that up. So uh, we do see pulmonary capillaritis in small vessel vasculitis, such as anchor vasculitis. We, see, we do see, um, you know, pulmonary capillaritis in, um, in juvenile dermatomyositis, sometimes we see isolated pulmonary capillaritis. And um, I mean, recently I took care of somebody who had pulmonary capillaritis from what was suspected to be cow's milk protein allergy and started years ago. And yes, we do see uh, pulmonary capillaritis in lupus, in vasculitis, in myositis, as well as primary pulmonary capillaritis or idiopathic hemosiderosis. So we take care of all those patients, yes. Right. Those are all the questions I have on my end. If anyone has any other questions they'd like answered, please put them in the chat. Again, Julie, thank you so much for this evening. This was very intensive and uh, very complete. Thank you so much for um, sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, your easy handling of all of our questions, which was very nice. Um, so thank you again. I just would like to um, uh, let our uh, membership and our guests tonight uh, that we have uh, another uh, lecture on September 19th. And uh, make sure you do fill out your post lecture um, uh, form so you can get your CME. And uh, we are coming to a Close, very close to a hard stop. So again, uh, Dr. Ganjuli, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, it was an honor and, we, and a pleasure. Um, we hope to bring yeah. you back and maybe even bring you back to the island. It's a thank you. nice thing to do. And I'd like to say good night to all of you. And thank you for attending this evening. Thank you.